Welcome to Inspire Side Chat with the Young Leaders in Sustainable Transport, a joint program by the Slogan Partnership on Sustainable Low Carbon Transport and Volvo Research and Education Foundation, or so REF in short. The goal of the Young Leaders program is to build bridges between the transport community and young people. It explores new perspectives by creating an interface between knowledge and policy. And that's exactly what we will explore today. The title of today's session is Fresh Ideas, New Leadership, a conversation across the timeline of transport transformation. The following discussion will be facilitated by my colleague, Christopher Decky, working on policy advocacy strategy and engagement at SLOCAT. We invited our colleague, Mark Major, senior advisor of SLOCAT, to share his experience and knowledge on transport. The participants of the 2020 Young Leaders and Transport Programme uh, Agni Veshpani, Cyprien Odada, Erika Martins, Silva Ramos, and Seple Samuel. Agni Vesh is a postdoc researcher on sustainable freight transport at the University of Memphis. Cyprien is an urban planner from Nairobi, Kenya, and she's an organizer of Critical Mass Nairobi. Erika is a PhD candidate focusing on psychology and transport at the University of Gothenburg. Sebe Samuel is a climate justice advocate and she's a co founder and organizer of Menget Lesev, Ethiopia's open street movement. So I can only wish you to enjoy this uh, discussion. Thank you very much. Thank you, Nicola. So, yeah, we wanted to, to kind of curate this conversation between our, our, our new leaders and, and, and Mark Major, um, who is a stalwart in the sustainable transport community and who is a senior advisor to the SLOCAT partnership. Um, because of his great experience and the work he's done in the, in, in the European level um, and in other places working to really promote sustainable low carbon transport uh, from the policy perspective. So we, we had shared some guiding questions with you all that really play on all of your strengths and experiences and the key elements of these guiding questions revolve really around the drivers of sustainable low carbon transport and ultimately the transformation of transport. Um, we had looked at different elements in these guiding questions around urban planning. Um, we looked at different issues around the open streets movements, freight transport, and then, of course, perceptions of mobility uh, and, and kind of like the, social, the, the psychology of how we transform transportation and people's views of sustainable mobility. Um, so before we get into this conversation, of course, I wanted to give Mark a few minutes to introduce himself, give a little background of his work, and then we can open the conversation from there. So, Mark, the floor is yours. Uh, hello, hello to you all. I'm really delighted to uh, to put names uh, to the faces. Um, and as Chris said, I'm I'm a senior advisor of the SLOCAT partnership. Um, I'm working about half of my time supporting the work of SLOCAT. Um, but I have 25 years of working on these transport policy questions. Um, and so I'm looking forward to the, this exchange. So, so you can understand a little bit the, my perspective. I, I started working on transport in the mid 1990s for the city of Nottingham in the UK. I'm, I'm English. And, and this was a really, really exciting time because we worked there a lot on, on, on shaping transport demand um, and looking at how the system was financed. So what is interesting about Nottingham, for example, is not the fact that they have a state of the art 21st century tram system, it's the fact that the planning of the transport was, was planned as a response to employers' demands for better access um, and is paid for by a tax on employers' parking. So we did a deal with them, okay, you want better, you want better access for your businesses to work better, we're gonna tax your parking and we'll invest that money in the tram. So it's not the supply of that tram that is interesting, it's, it's the partnerships and deal um, that funded it and created it. I then spent 15 years working for the European Union in Brussels. So I worked for the Ex European Commission, which is the executive branch of the European Union, working on transport from the perspective of research, from the perspective of the transport policy, from the perspective of the environment department, and also in the climate department. And, and so they, I was really working a lot with EU and UN processes on, on, on trying to get um, um, policies implemented. So legislation, and funding to implement policies. So of course, you can have all kinds of policy, blah, 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 but unless there's legislation or there's money, nothing is gonna happen. And there I saw very clearly this difference between the EU, 
where we have this qualified majority voting principle. So if the majority of people are in favor of something, it becomes approved and you have the program where you have the law. And then the UN system, where largely you're working by consensus and need to get everyone agreed before you can move on. And I can really see the kind of the differences in those two processes. Um, I also spent more than 10 years as a visiting professor at the Chinese Academy of Transport Science. So basically advising the Chinese government on mobility policy. And that was super interesting for me because, um, of course, you know, I don't understand a lot about China. I don't speak Chinese. So to see how policy was debated and advanced and considered um, in their process was extremely interesting. I had a couple of meetings with Li Keqiang, the prime minister. Um, as they were trying to grapple with this major problem for China. And that gave me some, some more, again, some insights into, you know, urban mobility in a completely sort of foreign context. That was great. And then in the last five years, since 2015, I've been working independently, half of my time for SLOCAP, but the other half of my time working with, largely with countries around the world, but some cities, trying to help them kind of get their transport policy organized. And what I see clearly, I think of it like as a triangle. You've got billions and billions of dollars being invested in designing, constructing transport systems and infrastructure. Um, you have all the work in transport operations, managing it on a day to day basis. But the top of the triangle, the policy, what are they trying to achieve? Where are they going with this? Is often badly thought through. So they have no clear vision of what they're doing. So they're committing billions in designing, constructing, and operating systems without any clear thinking. Is this about access? Is this about safety? Is this about clean air? What is it you're trying to achieve? And this, and so I work a lot at this very top of the pyramid, trying to get cities and countries to kind of have a clear understanding of what they're trying to achieve before they go ahead. So that's a little of the background of me and my, 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 how the, my perceptions of these problems have been formed. Is that clear? Yes, thank you, Mark. Um, so now that we've kind of gotten a bit of your background, I know that some of the young leaders had maybe a question or two for you. Um, did anybody want to ask Mark a quick question as we start this conversation? All right. So I guess we'll get the we'll get some of your impressions and backgrounds as we get this conversation going. So Mark, you were talking a bit about how you can kind of get policy to actually influence legislation right how these people at the top can actually get things um, to change on the ground right at the city and the country level um then in your experience how is it that you've been able to kind of work with those local officials people like urban planners um those that actually do the hard work on the ground to kind of understand these these overarching policy frameworks to ensure that the change is happening for everyday people's like for people's everyday lives Okay, so my approach to this is that um, it's all an implementation challenge. It's kind of easy. We could kind of quite quickly come to a consensus on a vision for a low carbon transport system you know, that was safe, you know, and we've seen glimpses of it around the world. And in fact, I think that all solutions have basically been implemented somewhere at a, at a reasonable scale. You know, some cities have done a great job on, on parking. Other cities have done a great job on on planning for logistics, others have done a lot on cycling, but it takes a huge amount of effort to do those one little things. And of course, on their own, those things are not transformational. So it's kind of an implementation challenge. How do you put the resources and leadership together to make all of these things happen? I think it's not like we're, we're waiting for some revolutionary new idea. We have basic understanding of what to do. It's just not implemented. So you need to think about the forces of that kind of implementation. And in, and in the cases of urban planning, I think this is, it, it's complex, isn't it? Because transport is influenced by multi, multi factors. So it's, you know, what, what supply is available, your needs, your constraints, the economies, customs, traditions, perceptions, there's a whole range of things that, that feed into it. And, and that makes it complex. And that's um, why it's really a challenge for the delivery, because it's this aligning of multiple actors. So in the case of planning, um, the urban planning you mentioned, I think it's easy to think about urban planning as just like space and the use of space, you know, these two dimensional plans, which is one thing. But actually, how cities function are a lot to do with, um, as I said, it's to do with customs and traditions. 
is, is one thing. Um, but actually, it's a lot to do with like, you know, where people invest, it's to do with tax rules, you know, like which businesses are set up where, under what conditions. Um, I, I'm a big fan of the, I lived in Belgium, where the European Union was based for many years. And, and there, there's a, there's a pharmacy on basically every street corner. There's like a huge number of pharmacies. Um, and that's super handy because every day you need to buy something or a bandage, you want to pick up a drug or you want to buy a pill or something, or it's really handy. But why are they there? And the reason is because in Belgium, they give a tax break to people that own and operate their own pharmacy. So if you're a pharmacist and you own and operate your own shop, you get like a tax break. So it's really encouraging this multiple. In my country, in England, it's the opposite. The market is dominated by these massive supermarket drug stores, which are cheaper. But of course, you've got one massive drug superstore um, in one location in a city. So there's actually not to do with the actual planning. It's the tax rules so that have favored this. And that makes a big difference. So it's really the it's the business models, the, it's the incentives, the customs and visions, as well as the physical layout. I think one of the transformations we're seeing now is this transformation to in-home or at-home service. So you might be able to download a digital service. You know, you don't need to go to the library to get the book. You can download a book or a film. Um, you can maybe get some services in-home, like medical services in-home, or you might get things delivered. And, and this is way beyond actual, you know, it's not about the vehicle or the distances. It's about the business models and economic forces that are shaping that. And, and I think this is the challenge for planners is to get a, get a grasp of this, because often these things are decided at state level um, or a national level um, and, and, and are kind of seen out of reach. And I think few planners think about this thing of how is a how is a city functioning in real life? Yeah, I mean, talking a lot about planning and kind of these other issues that come into play when you're trying to, to do something different in the city. Supreme, as, a, as an urban planner yourself, hearing what Mark is saying about tax incentives and about how you work with the business community and what it is that the consumer wants. What have you been seeing in your effort to try to improve the transport systems or mobility systems in the city where you work in Kenya? Okay, hi, hi Mark and hi everybody. My name is Supreme and I'm an urban planner working in Nairobi. Um, so, I was just nodding my head when Mark was talking because a lot of the things he was saying uh, I can resonate with, but uh, I don't know, unlike uh, what happens in the UK, in Kenya we have a lot of um, back and forth with legislatures. Sometimes we have really good uh, mobility policies, sustainable mobility policies, but getting legislatures to accept the policies or accept the transformation uh, that will lead to sustainable transport, that has been very difficult. So uh, myself and a few other young urban planners have decided to take a different route. Um, and basically what we're doing, we are doing the hard work, the dirty work, the designing process and the stakeholder engagement and getting feedback from the public about what they like about their city or how they, and they would prefer their city to look like. So we do all, the, we collect all that data and then we share it with now the policymakers and we show them that, you know, sometimes what they think is okay is not necessarily what the general public uh, likes or what majority of the people would uh, uh, envision their city to look like. So we are trying to, we are trying to bring out what uh, the general public feels by uh, using things like placemaking weeks or tactical urbanism projects here and there uh, because we realize just coming up with good policy documents doesn't really uh, support our case as much. A lot of the politicians and um, policy makers sometimes feel like, you know, a uh, policy document is just another UN project or another EU project. So they don't think it's, it, uh, it's important to them or they don't value it as much. But we, when we show them that the, you know, the general public is telling them that they're not happy, it's a different kind of uh, engagement which they're not used to. So that's the different route we are taking. And I think it's working. Uh, it's, 
it's starting to work. Yes. Yeah. Yeah, so yeah. I think the, this kind of outreach into the population, to the community, is actually changing the minds of the policymakers, is, is convincing them, let's say, that something needs to change. Um, and even though you don't need a fancy, you know, document, a policy document, you just need to know what people are thinking. And oftentimes there's that disconnect, right, between the policymakers yeah. and the population. Um, I mean, that's part of the issue, right? Like we always, I feel like in, in the global north and western cities, we always talk about the behavior change of people, of the consumer, of, of the person. But we don't really always talk about the, the thought change or the behavior change of the policymakers, because that's really where the problem lies, right? If we're trying to transform transportation, we're not going to save the world just by a couple of people riding a bike, you know, while the overarching policy frameworks are not accommodating almost a whole of society shift. So, I mean, I want mm -hmm. to kind of take that point to you, Erica, because I know this is where a lot of your research lies. Um, based on what I was just saying, like this real focus on individual behavior change. Um, what is being done to kind of flip it on its head, right? A bit that transforming transportation goes beyond individual behavior change to see actually policymakers start thinking differently about the needs of new ways of moving and, and, and moving trans like moving around and moving goods. Hello. Yes. Yes. No, it's okay. <laughs> yes. Um, yeah, so my name is Erika. I'm a PhD student in the Department of Psychology in the University of Gothenburg. Um, uh, as as you were mentioning, and I, I, actually I would like to start with a question. I don't know if you can answer because I'm quite new on uh, the topics of policy and legislation. I've been working mostly with. Uh, individual aspects of transportation behavior part but i would like to i will answer your question but before i would like to pose my question as well uh what would you consider the main factors that are blocking the link between policy policy makers and legislation like wh what is going on between this link when it works and when it doesn't work uh, is there a thing related only by acceptance of legislators or is it also a, a matter of uh, implications to the society that haven't been taken into account? So this is my question. You, I don't know if you have an answer for that, but uh, my concern, why I'm asking that? Because my concern is that we have lots of information from psychology. We have lots of research on human behavior, and um, but it, uh, they are not. Uh, they haven't been taken account, and uh, mostly when policy. So uh, from the literature that I have had contact, most of the policies have taken account lots of uh, infrastructure, lots of uh, um, in investments in uh, in new technologies. Uh, so autonomous vehicles and uh, and also new shops, uh, individual mobilities and this these topics they they are always present in all conference that I go and I've been to many conferences with engineers, but uh, I can't explain to them that if you put my grandma in that pod that go I don't know how many kilometers super fast she would not take that she would not accept that. Uh, so when the individual goes in this equation, and uh, this is this is really really that I want to figure out with this this whole project. It's it's really interesting that uh, I don't I don't understand why people's habits, people's uh, norms, social norms, and uh, why those aspects are not taken into account. So I you were talking about pharmacies, and uh, this is really interesting because I I I'm from Brazil, from the capital. And um, it's very interesting because uh, the city was totally planned in a shape of a, an airplane. So each blocks of res re residence, uh, you have a street with uh, stores and every each kilometer you have a new block. And we have this stupid street of pharmacies. So we have one single street with many pharmacies instead of having one pharmacy in each block, 
So if you are in the beginning of the, the, uh, the wing of the airplane, you have to travel all the way to go to the street to find all 15 pharmacies. But <laughs> each pharmacy could be placed in. Why did it happen? Because everyone has cars. So people just take their car and they go there and they go shopping and they can go in different pharmacies and they can try to get a better price. It's almost cultural to try to find the best price of something. So it, it, this, this kind of things influence a lot how the city is going to be planned and the cultural aspect, the norms. And uh, now in COVID, uh, it's really interesting to see that old habits has been breaking. So lots of people are cycling, lots of people are accepting to, to do more active transportation. And this is the moment to change. Uh, and I would like to know when, or maybe it's not an answer, but when this, this aspect it will be taken account when you develop the policy, because some behaviors are more affected by one a psychological aspect. So deciding to, 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 to change Private car use goes a lot with habit, but if you talk about cycling, it goes a lot with social norms. And then the policy shouldn't be taken account, uh, should be take that in account. That some things you need to change habits, another you need to change norms. And this implies that the infrastructure will be different and also the, the, the policy as well. Um, yeah, I think that, I don't know if I have added up Something no, I, to the conversation. That's, that's a very interesting point because you're talking about going to these conferences and there's all these great innovative ideas, um, but sometimes those innovators are not necessarily speaking to the policymakers who are not necessarily speaking to the population. And the policymakers have a ton of other outside pressures that are speaking into their ears. Uh, it's a very complicated situation. And of course, you're talking about your grandmother. Um, who's thinking about her, you know? Um, so it's it's such a dance, right? To see how these policymakers and all these different sectors of society are working in concert to actually produce change on the ground. Supreme, you had your hand up. Did you want to make a comment or respond to anything that was being said? Yes, yes. Yes, uh, I wanted to just make uh, two contributions to Erica's point or maybe answer what, uh, Erica's question on why there's such a big disconnect and I don't know about uh, Europe or Asia, but uh, I've worked uh, in Zambia. I've worked for, a, I've helped uh, the Zambian uh, tra Ministry of Transport develop their mobility plan. And we did a lot of research in Zambia. We also did some research in Uganda and Kenya. And I found that there was, uh, there are two very common uh, things. Uh, one was uh, the reason why a lot of uh, policy makers or legislatures do not are are more uh, keen on uh, car ownership or movement of cars is because in Africa most most Africans think uh, car ownership is uh, more is something to to admire. So if you even suggest you know bicycle use, you someone might think you're trying to take them back to you know, uh, digi uh, not digital, you're trying to take them back to the stone age. So it's usually very difficult to convince policymakers to adopt cycling or you know, even tell them that walking is a good thing. And the other thing is uh, the political mileage that they will lose. They think they will lose when they uh, support walking or cycling or other uh, sustainable mobility uh, options. And that's because a lot of their financiers are pro, pro cars. So they fear that if they support walking or cycling, they will lose uh, the financing plus now the support that they might get from their, uh, their supporters. So those two things have been really the, the two main things that affect, uh, that contribute to, yeah, that make the uh, policymakers decide what they decide. Yeah, and there's also this perception that having an automobile, having you know a vehicle of some kind, it it kind of shows your your status in society, right? And that's not just in an African context; it's 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 pretty global. It's been globalized in a sense. Um, Avnivesh, you had one comment to make. Yeah, that? yeah. Actually, when we when we were talking about the resistance that the policymakers or the 
citizens have towards policies. I was thinking, especially in the context of free transportation, an important point to add will possibly be the resistance and the industry has, because free transport is fundamentally driven by the economic interests as well. So I think the general perception that many of these policies might curb, uh, you know, the, the economic interests of the different agents that a freight system has, itself has been hampering a lot of, uh, you know, the, the, the practical implementation of these freight policies. So I just wanted to add that point. Yeah. No, it's a good point. Um, but before we, we talk a bit more about freight, I wanted to kind of pass the floor to Seble, like maybe comment on what Supreme is saying. I, I know, Seble, you're working very much in kind of these car-free walking movements, cycling movements, trying to improve the, 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 the way in which active mobility is seen as a good thing in, in some African cities, especially in Addis. Um, in Ethiopia. So did you have anything you want to add to that? Maybe see how the work you're doing is changing the perceptions of policymakers and local governments. Uh, yeah. Hey, everyone. Um, well, I guess for the experience from Mangad Leso, which means streets for people in Amharic, um, basically the, the vision of it is that we have our monthly programming in Addis Ababa and scale to different cities across uh, urban Ethiopia. Um, the vision is that we don't only have monthly programming, but that we're shifting how we're planning our, our cities and prioritizing active mobility, not only because that creates a sustainable future, but because it's also around spatial justice and the fact that most people don't own private vehicles. Um, I think the, the spaces that we've created in Addis Ababa, which are monthly around 15 kilometers of the city in seven different locations, um, is that it's creating space for people to reclaim their streets um, and I think that's important because there's not, although although uh, non-motorized mobility is the majority of how people move around, there's very uh, inadequate space that's allocated for these users. And so these monthly, this monthly programming basically gives that a chance for for the majority to actually feel as though they're majority because the infrastructure, even if it's temporarily for that moment, by reclaiming the streets, is for them. Um, and I think we've been also really fortunate that there's been a ton of political leadership in the sense that we have a, a co-organizing kind of collective and we gather every week. I mean, pre-COVID, we were gathering every week and it's it's led by the city administration and their, and their uh, transport and traffic management agencies. So um, there's a strong willingness on that front and there's been such financial support from them, but also just political willingness. And the Minister of Transport has also been really behind it, which is a, an important area to how we can scale it. That's the reason we've been able to scale it to other cities. And the one in March was supposed to take place in every region of Ethiopia. So I think I think having, having that um, political backing is really important, but it's also in the spaces we create, we have cycling classes for kids happening. I think it's, it's trying to make it more of a lifestyle and not just a one-off thing that's happening. Um, I think obviously it's really hard and I want to ask Erica about that too, about changing aspirations because um, there is this vision of progress as a vehicle. But I think I, I wanna, I'm curious to know what are kind of the tactics around changing that because especially for African cities, this is, this is this soaring death rate. It's still the highest death rate for young people around the world. It's from road traffic fatalities. So I like putting that forward or putting, you know, the loss of, of life from air pollution or all these ways that it's actually not aspirational to be moving towards a vehicle. So I guess I had some questions about the psychology of that, but, and obviously, you know, we have advocates in that space. There's people that want to do similar to what Supreme's doing in Addis around critical mass for Addis Ababa. Um, but I guess the tactics that we've been doing is a lot of just on the ground work and community engagement. And I think the most powerful thing about it has been because there's a lack of these public spaces, or infrastructure allotted to the majority, then people flood the streets for Mangad Leso because it's a, it's a chance for uh, for them to take up space in a way that doesn't unfortunately re reflect the reality of the rest of the week or the month, but for these moments um, can influence kind of a different direction and allow people to imagine what that could even be like. Because I think there's maybe potential resistance sometimes to say, okay, well, what do streets for people even mean? Because I have a car and I deserve this space, when you say no, it's actually the most transformative experience to have streets be for for people or for cyclists or skateboarders or whatever. And it's just a concept that we've said that streets have to be for cars, but we can totally flip that on that on its head 
And I think the advantage in African cities is we're not even dealing with car owning majorities. They're, they're vocal minorities, but there's like an example of at least 85 people who are not driving right. private vehicles. A yeah. vocal minority with a huge amount of the economic wealth, right? <laughs> mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Eric, yeah. I don't know if you wanted to respond to, to Eddie of Sebley's points there. Yes, yes, I, I want. That's really interesting. And thank you for, for sharing that part as well. It, it feels really strange to, sometimes it feels strange to talk about psychology because I feel that I'm using many words that are, you know, like academic words. And I, I, I want to speak as in the real ground world as much as possible. So it's, I think it's really interesting to talk, to think about social norms uh, in a way that what you were saying, uh, it's fancy to have your car or it's going backwards if you don't use a car. Uh, and it's, it's, it's part of the culture, like uh, teenagers get the car when they go to universities. Like this is, this is in Brazil, it's quite a common thing. Like when you have the majority, you get a car from your parents and, or you work very hard, the extra jobs to try to buy that old car and, I, I don't know, it, it, it's very cultural and it's really thing difficult, but I really like something you mentioned. And this is something that here in Sweden, they have been doing a lot. And I think it influenced a lot as well. Changing behavior is teaching kids to bike. So uh, really small kids, they go to work by bike with their parents and they have many, many projects for kids to have their first bike or to learn to cycle or to have, um, more contact with nature. It's part of the kids' curriculum in school. Uh, so the I think this I think this changed a lot of mentality because if you associate the car, if if you think about environmental behavior, and you don't have in your school any sort of education in, towards this topic, then it's really difficult to change when you are old, because ch children they have. They don't have strong habits. It's really easy to change their behavior compared to adults. So maybe we should be trying to change behavior of those that haven't got the first car yet, because as soon as they get, they get habituated to that and they don't want to give up anymore. Uh, what, what I have seen from research a lot is that uh, things that mostly change people's behavior is those disruptive scenarios like changing workplace, changing home. Uh, so when you go to the suburbs, you tend to use, maybe you, you, you use more public transportation instead of your car to not get stuck in traffic jams. And, uh, and also uh, changing children's behavior. Those are the main effective ways of, uh, so it, it, looks, it looks like a, a topic, say let's change children and what to do until they, they grow up. But I think we could start to target people that are less resistant because then maybe we'll create the social norm and, and then we start to talk about another kind of culture. Because if you just focus on those heavily based on um, private car, they will be re really resistant to new policies. And I think they will just, it will just be a clash. Um, yeah, I mean, when you're talking about this culture almost, it's like, um... It kind of makes me think of like being from the U.S. You know, it, it's almost celebrated. You know, when you finally are able to afford that used car, it, it's almost like replaying old movies from the 1980s and 1990s, where exactly. you know, when you have a, a movie about young people, the vehicle is like such an important part of an accomplishment within that film, right? Like it, it's so key. And again, with you know globalization of media, you're seeing that kind of cultural shift happening. You've seen it happen all over the world. Um, I want to talk a bit about sharing space on streets and roads, as Sebley was bringing up, and bring that into the, the freight context. But Mark, I, I, I want to give you the floor to make some comments there first. Yeah, yeah thank you. So I wanted to, to pick up on a couple of points and make, make some links between the things that... Um, so um, I, 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 I guess the, the regulations and the, and the politics that Supreme was talking about, this is often to do with, like, the, the supply of transport, right? It's like, you know, the infrastructure or the vehicles. And, and of course, that's one part of the problem. But I think it's really always important to be thinking about the, the demand as well as the supply. And so, you know, in what I've seen in my work, and I guess it's the same in, um, 
in, in your in your guys' experience in Brazil or or Ethiopia, is that actually decisions about education policy or health policy or tax policy, when they're making these decisions, which actually shape transport demand, they're not thinking about transport at all. So, I mean, of course, it's important to work on the decision makers about transport policy or transport infrastructure or transport services, but that's only like the supply. And the other half of it is, is the demand. And, and that's tricky because those people, when they're deciding like, what are the rules to which school you can go to and you know, where that is related to health, no, they're not thinking about transport, they're thinking about education policy or, or health systems. So these kind, of, these kind of public policies which drive the demand for transport, I think um, we, we need to think about more. And, and on, on um, Erica's point about the kind of um, um, behavior change, I kind of think that, I mean, I, of course, you probably know, but I don't, but I, I, I imagine that an important part of changing behavior is actually changing perceptions, like understanding the problem in different ways. And so if, if you're working with some people who are trying to kind of sell cars or, or you know, cars for road, roads for cars as the solution, I mean, my question is, then, well, what is the problem they're working on? What, what is the problem where the solution is more cars on roads? I would really like to know that because I think we're in the access business. We're trying to provide access to people. And there isn't a car priority access solution. Um, we, you end up with this kind of gridlock type situation. So there is not a solution to the problem of providing access. Um, and so I think perceptions and having a correct problem definition and challenging them on what they're trying to receive I work on access. I want the most number of people to have access to social and economic and cultural opportunities. Um, and I think this is, um, I think this thing about the, the street space and this tactical urbanism that Sebley was talking about is really, really important because, of course, that's changing perceptions, isn't it? It's like you're trying to showcase some things and get people to think of it in a whole new way. So, oh, actually, how do we use this space? Um, who should be using this space? For what? Under what conditions? And I think this is changing perceptions. And I think, I think that kind of thing is really important, but also very hard, because of course, there's a lot of, um, a lot of money trying to sell other kinds of solutions. There's all that incredible money that's spent on car advertising, trying to sell that kind of solution. You know, but when you're doing about those tactical urbanisms or car-free days, you're, you're trying to sell another kind of vision. You're competing with very, very powerful forces. But I, I think, um, I really think that kind of stuff is important. And I guess, Erica, that this changing your perception of the problem also changes in how you understand it and how you respond to it as a perception. I love you, Chris, at the end, you were talking about the US, which I think is great. I really enjoyed the, um, the economists that were, they were looking at average vehicle speeds and what it is, it's something like, you know, it's like 34 miles an hour is the average kind of vehicle speed. If you take the distance traveled divided by the time. But for a lot of low income Americans, if you take the distance traveled and divide it by the time for the travel, but also all the hours you have to work to pay for the car, to gas the car, to maintain the car and insure the car. So you take it about the total time you invest, it's about 18 miles an hour, the average speed. Because you know, if you're on a low income, you have to do a lot of hours to pay the car payment, the gas payment, the insurance payment. So this kind of making people think, those kind of things I think are really powerful because they change your perception of, you know, so clearly 18 miles an hour, you'd be better off kind of on the bus or, or on your bike. Right. I'll stop there, but I wanted to make, try and make some links between those different strands that were coming up. Yeah, no, that, that's really great, Mark, because I think what we're seeing is kind of this, this nexus between all the elements of the work that, that we do, whether it's around planning, um, um, you know, promoting active mobility, changing the way people think and the way people work. Sebley, were you trying to make another point? I just I had a question. Started, sorry if I cut you off. <laughs> no, that's fine. I just had a question because um, I've been, you know, we've been trying to see how can Mangal Leso take form during this period because we can't have massive gatherings and all these things. And and there really is big turnout to Mangal Leso normally. And there's been so many, you know, there's been so much use of tactical urbanism and pedestrianized and yeah, NMT streets as a COVID response strategy. But in this, in the context of Ethiopian cities, it's also been challenging because there's not, you know, a bicycle manufacturing industry in the country. There's, you know, not protected infrastructure for cycling, let's say. So it hasn't been possible, as in different cities, to just overnight 
create space for people to now cycle to school or work or however they, you know, commute in a new way because, you know, the public transport is not running at full capacity or something like this. Like there wasn't the really ability to make such overnight responses. Um, so I just wanted to, to ask because there's this resistance of like putting up protected infrastructure and all these things. But it's kind of like a catch-22 because you need you need different things. You need a population that will move that way. They they need to know how to cycle. They need to have access to bicycles. There has to be you know places for them to park their bikes. All these things kind of it's just so many different angles. And if you don't have one, it's hard to get the other. And there could be a lot of resistance. So it's kind of hard to say do everything at once. I just wanted to ask kind of you know you say like build the thing and the people will come and. But I, I don't know, because we had some experiences where first when we created protected cycling lanes, people were driving on them at the beginning until that had to be kind of like, you have to have a culture shift of, okay, this is not actually a space for a vehicle now. So I don't, I don't know, it, it just, I don't know what that process is, you know, a helpful process for that to take place or what's been more successful because, <clears throat> because unless, unless you're someone who's really familiar with with kind of being a daring cyclist in a city or if this is something you're so familiar with, it's scary to begin like that. But then it's also the resistance if you create the cycling space and people feel that it's not being used. So I don't know, just a lot of open-ended questions to that. As somebody who has a cycling phobia myself for many reasons, um, I, I and, and a New Yorker, I, I find it terrifying to even consider riding a bike in New York City <laughs> for some of those reasons. And I, and I wanted to kind of jump into some of the stuff that Agnivesh works on that's great because, you know, in New York, for example, we have this problem of sharing the road with these massive freight trucks that are doing delivery all the time um, and that take up bike lanes, that take up space and make it harder for people to walk um, and, and to use alternative forms of, of mobility. Um, so I wanted to kind of go to you, Agnivesh. Yeah, sure. What is happening on the front to make sure that you know, those who are making the policies, the planners, and the ones who are people like Seble, who are trying to actively change how people move on a daily basis. What are people in that work around logistics and freight doing to kind of accommodate and take that onto account? It's an excellent point that Mark had made about the different perception on the supply and demand side. And I think that that point is even more relevant and complicated in the freight sector. Because if you look at from the per perspective of the citizens, you know, who are using the road for their personal transportation. Freight is always like an enemy who takes up the space, the curb space and everything. At the same time, everybody wants faster deliveries as well. So it's a conflicting objective there itself. And if you look, look from the industry perspective, uh, for them, it's, the, the, every policy is kind of seen as, you know, an opportunity to limit freight transportation. And there's always this kind of a perception that all the freight policies Kind of might the hamper the economic efficiency of freight movements. So there's a lot of mismatch between the perceptions on both sides. And yes, the, 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 the difficulty is always in coordinating these three different endpoints, the policymakers, the you know, the, the end users as well as the industry. So how do you come up with a change that brings all these three ends together? So the, the issue is a little more complicated in the freight sector. So any effort that you see in terms of last mile mobility or anything, you know, something like autonomous delivery robot. You know, it's coming to take up even your curb space now. It's not just the road space. It's coming to your curb space now. So, <laughs> so the issue of space is becoming you know more and more complicated, and that question is more relevant now than ever. So, I think I think at the end of the day, I think we need to talk about a way in which we can transport freight in a very efficient way, with uh, you know which satisfies the citizens' needs at the same time. The policies that we talk about, it should not hamper the, you know, the, the fundamental need for people to get goods to their households as well. So it's a complicated problem, you know, and sometimes it, it, it can have simple solutions. But I think that's what we need to look for, to have some simple solutions for these com complex problems. Yeah. yeah, I mean, I just think about those videos, Agnivesh, where I see people on Twitter or, or wherever, yeah. like these robots walking down the street, and everyone looks shocked. And like, what is this? It's um, true. <laughs> <laughs> I know, Erica, you had your hand up before. I don't know if you wanted to make one more comment. I know you had to rush out early. Are you are you still there to make your comment, Erica? Yes, I am. <laughs> Please go ahead. Uh, just one second. Yes. No. Now I'm. I'm here. Um, so I just would like to add up. Uh, it was from from the 
the beginning um just to not let it sound that uh, it's inside of the individual and it's on their perception and because then it, it can be a bit cruel it, it's like uh, giving back the responsibility for the citizens to solve their own problems this can be a really good excuse right you can just say oh it's people's perception it's really hard to change it's inside their minds so i just would like to to make this highlight that uh changing behavior is not a matter of magic it's not because it's inside people's heads that is difficult to change um there are lots of techniques to do that and there's a lot of uh, programs to change behavior is it's not just a matter of uh yeah it's not something inside people's heads that and then that you cannot solve it's not that uh, it's just that perception is difficult to change, habits is difficult to change, mostly mm. because people that understand behaviors, they are not involved in those decisions. So when policy makers are taking their decisions, they not always consult psychologists, for instance, mm -hmm. or people that really understands how to change behavior. So it's, I think it's, that's my claim, like, a, Th th there are many strategies to change perception. Thank you, Erica. That's that's very interesting. And, and I think what this conversation is showing us that even though global policymakers and, and people at different levels are trying to break these silos and make sure more people are coming together to actually talk about social problems, um, it's still not quite happening at the level we need it to happen. Um, so I think we're almost at time. So that's perfect that Mark has his hand up because I did want him to to make some comments on some of the elements of this conversation and maybe me looking a little to what the future might hold for all of the professionals that we're working with, especially people like young planners, um, those who are working in social movements, freight. What do you think, Mark? <clears throat> yeah, um, I'll first kind of um, make a comment on what Erica said, and then I come back to the to the, the freight issues. But um, I mean, I think changing people's perception is important because, of course, that infects their behaviour. On, on one thing, that's one step. Of course, that that's an important part of this. But also, I think it it you know as the public perception changes, this influences politics very directly, and we we should not overlook that directly. So when Paris started publishing the figures, they were saying. 80% of our public space is being used to move 8% of the population. Okay, that's politically kind of very important kind of information. When people start to realize that the vast majority of the very valuable public space is used for the service, the interests of a, of a small minority, this changes the political the, the discussion. So I think we should also, I don't know exactly what your area of work is, Erica, but we should not, I think, this perception influences behavior, but also this influences politics as well. So that's uh, that that's a really important thing. And um, um, I think on the freight, um, we need a much, much closer alignment between freight and, and passengers. You know, it's basically shared infrastructure. We're using the same systems at the same time. And the idea that this is like two different worlds, you got all the transport people on one side and a small number of freight, th th this really has to change, particularly as investments in infrastructure are often driven by commercial interests. So the actual reason why much infrastructure is, you know, m projects are prioritized or pushed forward is often because of freight interests. So we need a much kind of greater kind of, and again, I mean, I think it's a perception like this thing Agnes, you said about, you know, like on, you know, people wanting things delivered in an hour's time or three times a day. I mean, they need to understand the costs and benefits of this. Huh? So this is not without costs in terms of whether that's environment or human cost for the driver or um so i think there's a there's an understanding there's a lot of education doing i mean i think th there was a great study a few years ago about the swedish transport engineers and they said uh, one question was like you know how much is the problem for passengers and how much is it freight and they said 80 percent of the problems we need to solve are freight they said, okay, so how much of your time do you spend working on passengers and how much is it? They said, oh, we spend 80% of our time working on passenger transport. <laughs> so, yeah. Total disconnect. <laughs> yeah, I, I mean, uh, those are the main points um, I think uh, I wanted to say. Although I, I do have some, on, some optimism for, for freight transport because, as Agnish says, th this is all largely driven by private interests. So if you if you get the framework right, 
you know, they will move really, really quickly. If the price signals change, if the planning framework change, they will move super quick. It's like there's less of this whole inertia, cultural inertia. If suddenly solution X is cheaper, they will move and transition really quickly. So it, it's a huge mammoth of a thing. But once it starts to change, it can it can change really quickly. And of course, you're, you're dealing with a much small number of actors who are much more kind of um, rational in a sense in their economic decisions. I mean, there's all kinds of madness um, in terms of the economic decisions about transport and freight. Um, they're more rational as consumers. Yeah, thank you for that, Mark. I, I, I mean, that bit of optimism, I think, is, is probably helpful considering everything around us seems to be going in the negative direction. Um, so to hear that, I guess, when freight is such a big part of the issue that we're dealing with, it's nice to hear that side of it. And hopefully when things do change and, and people like all of you are in influencing policymakers, ensuring shifts in society that leads us to a better place, we can actually see the, that movement um, towards a more sustainable, low carbon approach. Um, so thank you very much, Mark. Yeah, one more point, Mark, you had? Yeah, 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 yeah. Sorry, I, I didn't want to, didn't, wouldn't want us to stop without coming back to Sedley's kind of last kind of point. Sure. Is, um, is, is you were talking about, of course, if you provide all this kind of infrastructure and then it's not used, um, yeah, this is creating, this is complex. You get into a complex situation. And, and I think this is, I think it's false to think that we can always provide more and more and more and more options. You know, by expanding one thing, you have to reduce another thing. And so I think, you know, in your, some of your examples of, of road space, you know, if you're allocating more road space to one kind of activity, that has to be complemented by, by reducing space for others. Um, policy is about choices. And, and I think if you can have like, if you can package solutions together, so you're doing the cycle lanes, but you're also providing dedicated loading bays um, for freight, um, and you're reducing parking and charging for the parking, which pays for the cycle lanes and pays for the park, the, the freight fund. I think if you can package things together, I think um, you, you have to move, move forward with these policy packages. Just pushing one thing on its own is on, but you can create these kind of coalitions, you know, and you can't, you know, you, some cities get into conflicts between cyclists and, and urban freight. That you can easily enter into a conflict. But if you come up with a solution that works for the retailers, it works for the logistics operators, it works for the young people, you know, then you start to create like a more positive dynamic. And I know it's easy to say and hard to do, but I think we need policy is about choices. And you can't just increase cycling in isolation. It has to be balanced by a whole load of other things. And as I said at the beginning about Nottingham, when you create this positive relationship about the people who want better transport, them agreeing to pay for it and providing them with a solution, you get this kind of virtuous circle. That's yeah. why I used it as an example at the beginning. Yeah, Supreme, yeah. Go ahead, please. Oh, we can't hear you, Supreme. There you go. There so you when go. I read the, the question about uh, when uh, the uh, the question on how planners can become vanguards. Um, I it reminded me of a talk I did uh, a, a couple of months back, and I basically I was just talking about how urban planners uh, can be compared to artists, an artist who has a paintbrush, and I basically said, uh, you know, urban planners are the ones who design master um, a city's master plan. And it's the master plan that dictates where people are going to walk or where buildings are going to be. So if urban planners um, uh, use their powers, like the way an artist would use their paintbrush and come up with something that is disconnected or disjointed, or an urban planner designing a city that is not connect well connected, um, it just pushes people to have erratic behavior and not, uh, it doesn't make people want to behave in a manner where they love their city or respect their city. So I feel urban planners are very important, uh, but we have to, we have to change how we do things. And unfortunately, young urban planners like myself do not have the power to uh, overhaul a whole master plan. So what I would propose other planners and, uh, to do is to choose uh, pockets within the city where they could have mini transformations going on 
and maybe through those mini transformation they'll be able to change the perception of the public like uh for example uh, what uh Seble was talking about how sometimes they would have those temporary bike lanes but then the, the people themselves don't use it maybe it's because they don't know they're supposed to use it it's something something foreign to them so if you have pockets and you have you know maybe even selected number of people using it or people within your cycling community using it and just telling them one day 10 people should go and use the same thing the same infrastructure the community itself will start seeing that yeah this place is actually meant for that uh, particular use but for africa especially there are certain things that are still very foreign and we have to try try them out in bite-sized pieces otherwise it will mostly not work out so yeah i mean again complicated issues but i think you're right i mean planners young planners especially um, someone like you who does want to make that change they do have to find that niche where they can influence something um, because the paintbrush of the master plan from the planners that have probably been in their jobs for decades <laughs> you know influencing a city's generations i mean I mean, all of us as young professionals, we come up against some of these problems in all of our fields. Um, and the question is, how do people like us try to bring in new ideas when we're almost hit up against the wall? Um, so it's good that we are able to have these conversations to bring in people like Mark, who have so much experience, uh, who are also forward thinking, um, and to make sure that we are seeing changes taking place on the ground, not just in these you know, top level policy discussions, but actually seeing the changes, the transformations that people like you, Agni Vesh, are doing in freight, like people like you, Sevle, who are bringing people together to kind of change how they move, how they understand themselves as part of the city. You, Supreme, doing the planning work, the, the brush strokes. Uh, and of course, Erica, who's bringing new ways of thinking in, in her work in psychology and how that influences transport systems and mobility systems. So thank you, everybody. I pass it back to you, Nicola, to close this out. And I really enjoyed this. I'm so happy we were able to do this together. Yeah, thank you very much for this very lively discussion and uh, for this very great exchange, showing us what kind of challenges, but also what kind of opportunities um, await us in the future. And I think Chris has summarized very well. I don't want to add anything else. Um, just thank you very much for, for the contributions, for your collaboration in this exchange and um, you can of course follow us on our social media channels and our website where we'll, we will upload this um, session as well and hope to uh, we, uh, get the chance to talk to you soon again. Thank you very much. Thanks everybody. Thank you, Mark. Thank you all. Thank you. Good luck. Thank you. Thank you.